Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on 3 prime RNA seq for gene expression from single cells and low input samples. My name is Sam, and I'll be your host today. For today's webinar, we're going to focus on 3 prime RNA seq for gene expression, which means that we are going to be using um, a next gen sequencing approach to looking at gene expression. And the three prime refers to priming off the poly A in a lot of the mRNAs that we have in eukaryotic cells. So if you're thinking about the applications that this could apply for, we can use this for your generic gene expression, where we're looking at the differential expression between a couple of different uh, analytes or a couple of different samples. We can also use this for identifying RNAs that have a poly A tail. So in addition to looking at your typical cells and your um, situations like that, we could also look for mRNAs that might be in a liquid biopsy, so something you might isolate out of an exosome. By priming off the poly A tail, this makes it a very sensitive technique, and you all know the advantages of next-gen sequencing with building everything into a single library. So the type of samples that we can start with are single cells, up to about 10 nanograms of total RNA. I need to remind everyone, even though we're talking about really exciting things here, that the chydrin products shown here are intended for molecular biology applications. These products are not intended for the diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of a disease. For up-to-date licensing information, product-specific disclaimers, feel free to see the respective chydrin kit handbooks or user manuals. These are available on chydrin.com. They are available through the technical services or through your local distributor. So for today's webinar, we're going to focus on generating data sets. And this is one of my favorite data sets um, that we've looked at to date. This is a very complicated um, pathway map here of a particular um, samples that we were working on in our laboratory here. Well, when we started looking at gene expression as a way to be predictive for this particular type of, of samples that, that we were working on, we had a couple of different approaches that we could start with. We could start with the traditional microarray approach where we take our samples, we extract the RNA, and then we go through and we look at all the different transcripts that are there. Unfortunately, for the amount of sample that we had and the application that we're doing, we only have anywhere from 10 to maybe 1,000 cells, and we're trying to keep the volumes very small because we're doing a small molecule a screen here. So for microarrays, we really didn't have enough sample, and we wanted to look at thousands and thousands of samples at one time, and it just got to be too laborious and cumbersome. We could switch over to doing what would be a traditional RNA sequencing experiment where we would go through and we would sequence all the RNA that's there. With um, 100 cells, there's not a lot of RNA, but we had a couple of different options that we could go through. At about the same time, we started to develop out this three prime sequencing kit, and it actually uses what I call reduced um, transcript transcriptomics. When we're doing our three prime sequencing kit, as you'll see as we get further into the webinar, we actually only sequence the three prime part of the RNA which means that instead of using 20 million reads per sample, we can use a million reads and cover the complete transcriptome. So this complicated picture that you see here is actually some data that we generated. It's a small snapshot of a corner of the transcriptome. But here in this particular uh, experiment, we're looking at genes that are not changing, genes that are being upregulated, and genes that are being downregulated. And all this information came from a single well of a 96-well plate. At the same time, we ran uh, about a dozen of these plates on a typical NGS instrument that you may have in your core facility or your laboratory. When we talk about doing gene expression, gene expression can be uh, on an NGS platform, can be done with a couple of different techniques. And depending on the information that you need out of your sample, you can choose to go through and you can use um, what's referred to as traditional stranded RNA-seq, you can use targeted RNA-seq, or you can use three-prime RNA-seq. Uh, this slide kind of summarizes the RNA-seq por por portfolio that we have here at Kyogen. In the top here, I have our traditional RNA that we're looking at. We have a five-prime cap, three-prime polyadenylation sequence, 
This is a four exon uh, transcript under most of the time. However, it may be differentially spliced. If we're looking at the number of reads that we need per sample, this refers to if you were to run this on your Illumina sequencing machine, how many reads that you would need to cover a, a complete transcriptome. So for a stranded RNA-seq experiment, with this particular type of library, you need to start typically with at least a microgram of total RNA. We often do an mRNA enrichment to isolate all the RNA that's there that has a poly-A tail. This allows us to sequence the RNA that will be eventually translated into a protein, and it removes the ribosomal RNA and other RNAs that we don't want to sequence. With this type of sequencing, we'll be able to identify all of the RNA that's there, as well as different splice variants that may be there. So if our traditional reference uh, uh, gene up here gets spliced so that we have differential inclusion of exon uh, 2, we'll be able to identify that. At the end of this, we use 20 million or more reads per sample. And on a MySeq uh, instrument, we can do one or two samples. On a next seek, we can do anywhere from six to maybe 24, depending on whether you use a low input or a mid throughput cartridge. Targeted RNA seq is another method we can use for going through and looking at the differential expression. So, whereas your stranded RNA seq experiment will give you differential expression of the, the genes that you're looking at, it is a very complex bioinformatic process to get through. And if you want to start with FFPE, or you want to start with um, samples that are highly degraded. If you wanted to identify genes that don't have a poly-A tail, and you want to collapse the sequencing space that you're looking at, we can use targeted RNA-seq. With targeted RNA-seq, we typically build panels that are anywhere from 12 to 1,000 genes, which means that on your NGS sequencing machine, you can run anywhere from a few samples up to hundreds of samples at one time. The typical number of reads that we need per sample are anywhere from 0.5 million to 4 million, depending on the number of targets that you have, the complexity of your transcriptome, and how deep you need to sequence into that sample. Um, for the kits that we use at Kyogen, we usually recommend anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 reads per individual gene. So you would fall somewhere between 0.5 million to 2 million reads for your targeted RNA-seq experiment. With targeted RNA-seq, this is very similar to a PCR layout and PCR analysis, which is greatly simplified as compared to your stranded RNA-seq. The next type of library that we can build, and what we'll focus on today, is 3' RNA sequencing. With 3' RNA sequencing, this is a technique that is gaining a lot of popularity, especially for researchers that are only interested in differential gene expression. So you want to know which genes are going up and down compared from your couple of samples. And this becomes especially useful if you're using non-canonical or what I would say are not the most popular species in your research. So for human, mouse, and rat experiments, when we're doing small RNA sequencing, or excuse me, when we're using um, short read sequencing, we often need to map this back to a very well annotated transcriptome. So for your stranded RNA-seq experiment, your data is only as good as your mapping and your alignment ability. This also goes for your targeted RNA-seq. These tend to be more accurately mapped because you're looking at a very small part of the, the transcriptome. If you're working with species other than human, mouse, and rat, so you're working with dog, rhesus macaque, cat, um, lizards, dragons, what it may be, 3' RNA-seq might be a better method because we have very well annotated transcriptomes around the 3' end of these um, gene targets from a lot of experiments that have been done on, over the last 20 years. However, we may not have complete transcriptome coverage in order to differentially uh, align the different exons that may be uh, expressed and not expressed. With 3' RNA-seq, the kits that we're going to be talking about today come in two different flavors. We have a transcriptome for complete transcriptome coverage. Typically, when we're doing our three prime sequencing at Kyogen, what we do is we focus on just sequencing the region around the poly A tail. This allows us to do what I call reduced transcriptomics. It means that we're only focusing on a very short region of the RNA. 
the samples that we can use can be also FFP or fragmented RNA, or they can be high quality RNA. The only requirement is that we have a poly A tail for doing the reverse transcription reaction. We also have targeted panels. With targeted panels, currently we support human and mouse applications. And with targeted panels, you can select anywhere from 12 to 1,000 of your favorite genes and go through and we can build a panel for that, which greatly cuts down on the number of reads that you need per sample and allows you to run thousands of samples at one time. With 3' RNA sequencing, it is increasing in popularity really because of the sensitivity that you can have around these kits. They can be universal kits, and you can use them in a couple of different ways depending on what your experimental question is. With 3' RNA sequencing, this enables single cell research, or you can use it for population-based sequencing. So anywhere from one to 100 or 1,000 cells can be used in 3' sequencing. Most of the time we use what's called a direct lysis plus sequencing. We take the cells, we put them in a lysis buffer, pop them open, expose the RNA, we do the reverse transcription reaction, and then from there we can go through and build the library. We no longer go through and worry about isolating the RNA or losing that when we're starting with cells. We can also start with already isolated RNA, so 10 picograms, which is about one cell's amount, up to one nanogram or more. In the kits that we talk about today, we'll be using 10 picograms up to 10 nanograms, which is up to 1,000 cells worth of material. And you can start with total RNA. There's no need to go through and do an mRNA enrichment or a ribosomal depletion. With the ability to prime off the poly A tail, we are selecting for the mRNA component within your total RNA fraction. So this saves time, it doesn't corrupt the library, and it allows us to go through and have a very cost-effective approach to sequencing. With this poly A tail, this offers a universal location for the reverse transcription reaction, and it may offer a more concise gene expression data. If you think about RNA and the processing of RNA, once an RNA has acquired a poly A tail, it's usually on the way from the cytoplasm out toward, or excuse me, on the way from the nucleus out toward the cytoplasm. By having a poly A tail, this is almost a guarantee that this RNA is eventually going to be translated into the actionable protein. When we're doing techniques such as stranded sequencing and we're doing ribosomal reduction, or when we're going through and doing mRNA enrichments, often we go through and when we do the alignment, we find that the RNA that we're capturing may not have been completely um, processed or might be in certain areas within the, the cell, especially the nucleus. Um, where it's not going to be translated into a protein. So one of the, the problems that we often see when we do and try to align our gene expression data to what's going on at the protein level is when we're doing these large ribosomal reduction type um, experiments, we're capturing RNA that's not exactly into the cytoplasm, which means that that RNA can't be regulated by small RNAs such as microRNAs, it also won't be translated into protein and that's where we often see the disconnect between gene expression and functional protein analysis. For the use cases with, um, with doing 3' sequencing, the most common use case is to look at gene expression. However, differential polyadenylation is a promising biomarker. If you go through and start to look at some of the highly annotated transcriptomes, especially the human and mouse, you can see that there is differential polyadenylation, different um, three prime processing of genes, which is tissue specific. It may regulate the stability of the RNA, and we can see changes in polyadenylation when cells get stressed or something becomes um, outside of the physiological norm. So by using targeted sequencing as well as transcriptome sequencing from the 3' end, we can identify potential biomarkers, and these biomarkers may be um, very good indicators of something going on within the cell. With 3' sequencing, we can address whole transcriptome and targeted approaches, which means that if you're using a MySeq or a NetSeq, you can actually turn a MySeq into a transcriptome uh, uh, machine. You can do anywhere from 25 uh, on up number of, of transcriptomes per individual sample, depending on how deep you want to sequence into it. And with a targeted approach, we can focus on a very large subset of the transcriptome that may be most important for your research 
and increase the number of cells or the number of observations you have and really increase the statistics around these gene expression changes. So when we're looking at low expression changes, we can really have enough observations to know whether or not that's a statistically relevant gene expression change. Trying to erase my uh, drop my things here. Oh, well, anyways, here's a typical experiment where we might decide to use three prime sequencing to go through and to um, to look at differential gene expression. In this particular experiment, we are starting with our cells. And this is a small molecules uh, screen. What we're trying to do is go through and to add back a novel compound library that we've uh, come up with here. We're going to add it back to our cells. And what we want to look at is gene expression changes and map them back to the pathways that are being activated. Or if we activate a pathway, we want to see whether or not the small molecules can turn off or modulate that pathway. In this particular experiment, we start with 96 or 3D4 well plates. We can do the experiment a couple of different ways. Um, our forward approach is to start with cells, treat the cells, and then from there, depending on the downstream application, we can either isolate RNA or we can start directly with the cells. In the experimental data that I'm gonna show you today, um, the pathway that we took was to start with cells, to treat the cells, take the cells and to lyse them with our three prime RNA sequencing lysis buffer, and then take the cells and directly put them into the library that we're working at. With the methods that you may be using in your laboratory, um, isolating the RNA is also a good way to go, depending on if you wanna go back to that um, individual experiment and verify the gene expression changes using qPCR or other methods. When we've done this also, if we have enough of the compound to do it a couple of times, we may go through and start with the cells, treat the cells, and then go and isolate the RNA. Typically for this, we're starting with more cells uh, and a 96 well plate. If we do the 384 method, we'll go directly from the cells into the library. The way that we are going to be doing this experiment, um, and depending on the workflow that you have in your laboratory, we've set up our three prime sequencing kits with three different plastic formats. The most popular plastic format is shown here on the left-hand side, which is our 96 well breakable plates. With our 96 well breakable plates, what we do is we start with the reverse transcription primer already deposited inside the well. So in order to go through and to start the experiment, we either need to deposit a single cell into the plate, or we can put um, our cell lysate into the plate, or we can start with our extracted RNA into the uh, individual well. When we add it to the well, we will reconstitute the reverse transcription primer that's already in there, and then we'll add back the enzymes to start the reverse transcription process. If we're collecting cells, we may start with the lysis buffer already in the plate, and we'll shoot the cell into here from our fax machine, or if we're picking cells, we'll pick cells and we'll put it directly into the lysis buffer that's in the plate. With this 96 well breakable plate, in between each of these wells, there's a little perforation, so if you're only doing eight transcriptomes today, you can go through and just take off the first well, our first uh, column. If you're going through and you wanna do 12, you can take the first uh, row. If you wanna do 24, you can break the plate and then you can store the rest of the primers for another experiment that you may do on a different day. If you're going through and you're using a MySeq, for example, you might do 24 transcriptomes per individual 150 cycle uh, flow cell that you're using. The second version of the um, product that we've come up with is our 96 well, and we call this our 96M format. With the 96 well plate, this plate contains all of the primers lyophilized down that we use for the reverse transcription reaction, and you can resuspend the primers with the um, lysis buffer, with a buffer for just putting them into solution that you will use for total RNA, and you can play around with the concentrations. 
So if you're interested in automation, if you want to make your own protocols, this is really what we call our developer plate. So the 96M format is the format that allows you the most flexibility to design your own workflows in your laboratory, to change the concentrations. If you want to make a um, very small reaction, you can do it with this format. With the 384 well format, this is a single use 384 well plate. In each of the wells is the primer for the reverse transcription reaction. And to use this, we just need to get our RNA or our cells into the 384 well plate to start the reverse transcription reaction for the, the reaction. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is the name of the product. We call this our UPX or Ultraplex product. So up to now, what I've told you is that we do a reverse transcription reaction in each of these wells here. But what's really unique about this product is that after we do the reverse transcription reaction, we can now treat each of these individual wells as a single sample. And we can now combine this into one tube for ease of, of use and ease of library construction. So in a typical workflow, what I'm showing you here is our 96 well breakable plate. I'm gonna go through and do all 96 reactions here. In each well here, we have our individual primers. The primers that we use here to drive the reverse transcription reaction are using a couple of different molecular barcodes to give us the ability to track each molecule that gets reverse transcribed, to track each individual well, and then at the end we can track each plate that gets combined together in a sequencing run. So if you've ever done a traditional stranded RNA-seq library and you were doing 96 samples, you probably had to keep all 96 samples um, separate until you got down to the point that you could combine them, which is usually after the last step when you do sample indexing. With the UPX workflow from Kyogen, we can combine the samples as soon as we've completed the reverse transcription reaction. So, here is um, our primer that we use for the reverse transcription reaction. We have an oligo DT part that will bind to the poly A tail. We have a UMI, which is a unique molecular index. This is a, a 12 base random sequence. With the UMI, this allows us to tag each molecule that we capture. And when we get to the end of our data analysis, it allows us to remove any amplification or um, any bias that's introduced during library construction. So this allows us to have very accurate quantification. We have a cell ID. The cell ID is a fixed sequence, and each individual primer that goes into a well has a fixed cell ID. So the really nice thing about if you're working with single cells is that if you sort single cells based on a phenotype, so you're looking at high expressors versus low expressors, or whatever goes into this individual well, you can link this back to the beginning information. And this is a little bit different than other types of single cell analysis, where maybe you're thinking of doing drop seek and you put all of your cells into a um, emulsion type uh, experiment where you lose the um, individuality of each of the individual cells. Once they go into an emulsion, such as a 10X platform or, or something else like that, you lose the ability to track the cells that went in. But by having this cell ID, when you deposit your cell into the well, you can now go back and link the transcriptome to some sort of upstream uh, analysis, such as the um, expression of a particular surface protein or the differences in the expression of that. The reason why we, we've gone through and we have the unique molecular index is shown here. The principle of the unique molecular index is to allow us to have very accurate gene expression data, as well as giving us some the ability to have accurate reprocessing and also to know the sequencing depth required to cover that complete transcriptome. In the case of a gene expression experiment, this is um, a typical experiment you may be doing in your lab using NGS. We start with our two different samples. We have sample one and sample two. What we want to look at here is the differential expression of our RNA. So we have four copies versus one copy. We go through and we make cDNA, where we preserve the original ratio of four to one. However, when we go through and when we do the multiplex library construction, when we do the sequencing, there may be different amplification efficiencies of each of these um, individual transcripts, especially in the background of thousands of different primers. 
And when we get to the end and we do our final read processing, maybe we have 12 reads versus six, which is now an experimental ratio of two to one. Our original ratio was four to one. And now what we've done is we've changed really the biology that's around here, not based on the biological sample, but based on looking at just the raw reads. Remember, anytime we start with less sample, we often have to amplify it more in order to go through and to add it uh, and to have enough library to sequence. And low expressing genes get corrupted much more than your most high expressing genes. And it's often the low expressing genes which drive the biological differences that we have between our samples. So what we need to do when we're doing gene expression experiments is really to make your sequencing machine much more quantitative. And what I'm showing you here are two different use cases here. On the left-hand side, we have five replicates of one transcript. So we started with one transcript. When we got through with the sequencing, we have five reads. They're exactly the same because we're doing Amplicon sequencing. So there's no way to tell the difference between the left end and the right end or the size of the Amplicon. On the right-hand side, I have a different situation. I have five unique transcripts of a gene. With five unique transcripts of a gene, these were genes that were expressed with five different transcripts. We ended up sequencing at one time. What your sequencing machine can't do is tell me the difference between the situation on the left and the situation on the right, but it is very important. But by going and adding a unique molecular index, here you can see we added the gray index when we captured the transcript and we amplified this out five times. When we go through and we count this, we count this as just one transcript. All right. On the right-hand side here, you see we have five different UMIs. When we go through and we count this, we captured each of these one time, and we count this as five. So by adding back the unique molecular index, we can preserve the original ratios much better than we can without it. And so when we go back to our experiment here at the beginning, we had four transcripts versus one. We gave each transcript a unique molecular index. We went through and we built out the library we use the reads on the gene body to do the alignment. And then what we do is we count the number of unique molecular indexes. So one, two, three, four versus one. And this means that we can preserve the original ratio of what we're working with. The UMIs are something that we use standard in all of the targeted sequencing platforms that we have at Kyogen. And in the Kyoseq 3 prime UPX kit, we are using the same 12 base UMIs and we do have software to demultiplex this at the end of the experiment. So there's really no reason uh, to not use these uh, for accurate quantification. The other thing with UMI is this can also give us precision sheet sequencing um, when we're looking at the um, variant calling or in the case of our gene expression when we're doing the alignment back to the transcriptome. Single bases, which sometimes may be an actual variant within our sample, or maybe a sequencing or PCR artifact can cause all sorts of problems when we're doing the alignment. So in this particular example here, we're looking at EGFR. This is uh, an Exxon 21, where we're going through and we have this read mapping here where we see one of the reads actually has a variant here. And what we need to understand is this actually a PCR sequencing artifact, or is this actually a true low frequency mutation or variant that's being expressed? By adding the UMIs before we do any amplification, when we go back and we do our alignment, we can look at the same family of UMIs. They came from the same capture event and then were amplified. On the left-hand side here, we can easily see a false variant. Where on the right-hand side here, we can see a true variant, or an actually, in our case for gene expression, a really true, um, a true expressed variant that would be in our sample. Last thing that um, UMIs allow us to do is to look at the um, diversity or to model how deep of the library we actually sequence. This is an application that we um, often do uh, a lot here. This is looking at T cell receptors. When well, anytime you're going through and you're sequencing your libraries, you often don't know whether or not you've sequenced deep enough to cover that entire library. You need to often guess based on the times that you start to see duplication of the sequences. By having the UMIs there, we can look at the number of reads per UMI, and anytime the number of reads per UMI gets greater than five, we can have high confidence 
that we sequence all the library that you have there and that you don't need to sequence that library any deeper. This means that after the first run of any of our kits that have UMIs, we can often go back and do optimization where we can decide on either adding more samples or subtracting samples to have the ideal read depth per each sample, per each experiment, to make sure that we cover all the data that we want to and we don't leave any data behind. So going through our workflow here, we're going to do individual reverse transcription reactions. When we do these reverse transcription reactions, we incorporate in the UMI with all the added benefit there for accurate quantification, read mapping, and knowing the depth of our library. We have our cell ID, which is a fixed sequence, so we can come back and know which cell went in here or which sample went in here. We do the reverse transcription reaction and we pull all the samples together in one tube. Typically for us, this can be anywhere from eight transcriptomes up to 384. And then what we can do is we can add another sample index. We can add a sample index for each of the individual plates that we're looking back. So if we go back to the original experiment that I was doing with our um, small molecule screen, we actually had three 96 well plates worth of cells. We went through, we dosed them with different amounts of the drugs that we were looking at. We used a series of different compounds. We went through and took the cells, we made a cell lysate, put them into our 96 wall plates, did a reverse transcription reaction. Each individual plate was combined and simplified down into three tubes for library processing. The last step, we gave this a plate index. And then we combined all 288 samples onto one sequencing run. In our case, we're running a, a NextSeq here with a 400 million read um, um, cassette, which means we're getting about 2 million reads per sample. It's over-sequencing uh, these samples. We need about 1 million reads, but that's uh, a way that we can cover 288 samples on a NextSeq experiment, full transcriptome coverage in uh, about three days of work. So just to summarize here, when we're talking about the UPX kits, we'll be having the UMIs, we have the size, which are for each individual sample, and then we have the pies. These are used for each of the plates, and they give us the ability to do better quantification, easier library construction, and higher throughput. How do we go through building these libraries? The library construction is um, a very simple uh, construction method. Um, what we've done here is we've really incorporated a lot of know-how into the UMI design and the UMI processing with our um, bioinformatics. We've gone through and we've looked at the cell IDs and we've color balanced these for the different Illumina sequencing machines, as well as the final sample indexing you need for the different plates. We start with the RNA that you extract, that you um, get from either your cell lysate or from the total RNA that you've extracted from the cells. We do the reverse transcription reaction. With the reverse transcription reaction, we use the traditional template um, switch mechanism on the five prime end. So your reverse transcriptase goes through, and when it gets to the end of the transcript, it will add untemplated nucleotides. When it adds these untemplated nucleotides, we can add back a primer that will bind to this. It allows us to do the reverse transcription reaction of the, re of the complete template. Then we go through and we amplify this complete transcript by using a single primers that bind to the, the um, five prime end of our poly A, uh, of our oligo DT primer, as well as the reverse complement of the template switch oligo. After we do this, we then do a little trick here to reduce the sequencing space where we um, now go through and we fragment our sample using Kyogen's FX enzyme. The FX enzyme mixture is a mixture of different um, types of DNA cutters. It is a random fragmentation process. And what it does is it randomly fragments up the RNA into smaller pieces. Then we can go through and we do end repair. So we get double-stranded DNA back. We do A addition, and then we do adapter ligation. During this adapter ligation, we add back um, binding sites for the final indexing. And the final indexing is for all of the samples within that tube. With that index, it gives us back the final, um, what we would refer to as the plate index. It completes the library. We now do library quantification, prep for sequencing, do sequencing, and then our final data analysis. 
For data analysis, we've um, established a, a site within Kaijin, which is called the Jingle Data Analysis Center. The data analysis is included in the cost of the kits. For the Jingle Data Analysis Center, all we need is the raw fast key file that comes off of your um, sequencing instrument. Or we can also have the Kaijin Jingle Data Analysis Center pull the fast key file directly from Illumina Base Space if you're using Base Space to capture uh, the files that come off your sequencing machine. When you log into the Jingle Data Analysis Center, you can establish yourself a free account. That free account gives you access to the data analysis space. When you go into the data analysis space, you'll see four different tabs. The first tab is the base space file. So if you click on this, this will go to your base space account and you will give yourself permission to pull the file. You can either pull it from your projects or your runs. There's also a tab for uploading your FASTQ file. There's a file management tab that allows you to keep track of the files that you've in, um, uploaded into the Kaijin website. You can also share the files with your collaborators. And then you have the final analysis. And unfortunately, this says TCR analysis. This actually says UPX analysis here, but I pulled the wrong screenshot here from this, uh, this uh, file. How we do the read processing, there's a file there that will show you the read processing. And once you've uploaded your file, it will go through and start an automatic pipeline. With that automatic pipeline, it will allow you to go through and um, are actually on the back end. Uh, what we're doing at Kaijin is we're extracting the cell indexes, sequences from the reads. So we're going through and we're extracting out the different molecular barcoding. We demultiplex the reads to the individual samples that you started with. We do vector and quality trimming on the reads, align with the star aligner. And then we go back and we can do um, either a transcriptome or a targeted uh, analysis. With the transcriptome, you will get all of the reads and the unique molecular indexes per individual gene. If you do a targeted approach, when we build the targeted panels, we've already gone through and done the bioinformatics to identify all the different uh, differential polyadenylation sites. So when you pick a gene for your targeted panels, we will spike in all of the primers necessary to cover the different polyadenylation sites. And the data you will get there will be the individual reads per polyadenylation site. Once you've done this primary analysis, we also provide secondary analysis. And for secondary analysis, this is moving to the, um, the actual differential expression for a bulk sequencing, so when you're starting with more than uh, two cells, or you can do a um, clustering for single cells. The supported sequences, uh, excuse me, supported species that we cover, we cover all of your traditional life sciences um, model species, so human, mouse, chicken, um, chow cells, and you can read the rest here. We have aligned this to also be um, something that can be verified with um, qPCR by using our RT2 profile or PCR arrays. In addition, we also support uh, about 90 uh, other species. So currently we have 99 species that are supported with 114 different uh, transcriptomes. And you can read off the list here and maybe find the, the favorite species that you're working on. Now, if you're working on a species that isn't covered here, it doesn't mean that you can't use the data analysis site. The problem is, is that we just don't have a very well annotated transcriptome. So if this is um, something you want to do on, uh, maybe there's um, really low representation here of there certain plant species. If you have an annotated transcriptome, this can be uploaded into the Kaijin uh, Gene Globe Data Analysis Center by uh, contacting uh, uh, the technical services at Kaijin. In addition, the algorithm that we're using for doing our read alignment is also available on GitHub. So you can download our um, read alignment uh, program. You can internalize this with your own bioinformatics team, and you can go through and play around with this to uh, do your own three prime transcriptome analysis using the Kaijin developer packs. For the secondary analysis, this is where we start to translate those uh, reads per unique molecular index, which is your gene count, into the differential expression, or in this case, this is the secondary analysis for the single cells, which will allow us to go through and do cell clustering and get to the um, output. One of the things that we've done here with our single cell um, analysis 
is we know that there's going to be heterogeneity in the samples that you're working with. That's the reason why a lot of people look at single cell analysis. However, we want to identify the reason for that heterogeneity. So what we do is we take the data that we have and we do a QC method and we look to drop low quality cells or low expressed genes um, and we we quantify the genes based on the number of molecular indexes that's there. If you have less than a certain number of molecular indexes, and often that number is three, then we're going to drop those as being important in driving the clustering. That data is still there, but we're not going to use it because it causes um, unnecessary scatter or actually artificial clustering within your samples. Then we do a normalization, and this normalization allows us to account for cell-specific technical variation. We identify the highly variable genes, and then we were going to output the cell clustering, identification of the cell populations using PCA analysis. We will identify marker genes, and then we'll have an output, which are different figures, tables, and output. By identifying the marker genes, these are the genes that are driving the clustering, and presumably would be the genes that maybe explain molecular mechanisms that you're looking at. These would be a short list of potential targets that you would want to go through and verify in a targeted um, sequencing approach after you've done a transcript on screen. If we're using our, um, doing our secondary analysis for um, a population-based uh, approach, then we're going to use our GeneGlobe Data Analysis Center. This will allow us to perform gene expression and it will spit out the fold regulation results. Um, the Gene Analysis Center is set up to run thousands of samples at one time. It's just a certain, um, you have to let us know which are your control samples, which are your experimental samples. You can tell us what samples need to be grouped together if you're doing any sort of replicates. And then you just tell us which comparisons you want to do, upload it into the Data Analysis Center, and it will go through and run a um, series of different um, analysis, uh, different normalization, and then spit out the results. And you can take the results that align best with your experimental output. Here's some application data uh, of showing you um, how the kits work. We've generated a lot of application data, um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of it, to establish the reproducibility and linearity of the um, input amounts, um, reproducibility of using different um, parameters, such as the amount of cells, researchers um, doing it in the lab to show robustness, uh, running on different sequencing instruments. Um, the experiments that are showing here are also available in a couple of technical documents that we have available on the website. So we're looking at one nanogram replicates here between two different uh, samples here. You can see pretty good linearity here, 100 picograms versus one nanogram. We've gone through and looked at the number of genes that you will, um, or the number of total molecules that are detected across different samples. So the total molecules are based on the numbers of, of UMIs that are captured. Um, this translates down, if I, I wonder if I have the next slide here, into the number of genes, which is probably more informative for most researchers here. So what we're looking here is at one nanogram of RNA, 100 picograms of RNA, and 10 picograms of RNA. On the y-axis here, we have the number of detected genes here, and then what we're looking here are eight different um, experiments. So you can see on average we detect anywhere from seven to maybe a high of 9,000 genes with a nanogram of RNA at the depth that we sequence, which is about a million reads per sample, um, down to a low of about uh, 1,000 to uh, I think about 1,800 genes if you're starting with 10 picograms of RNA. In this experiment, we started with the HEC-116 uh, and we started with RNA that had been previously extracted and we um, combined the samples into a single library. So for specifications around this kit, if you're thinking of using this kit, this is a kit that is designed for anywhere from a single cell or 10 picograms of RNA up to one to 10 nanograms of total RNA. We have tested this up to 10 nanograms in a thousand cells and everything is as linear as if we're using uh, lower quantities amount. I wouldn't recommend going past 10 nanograms of RNA. That's pretty much um, going past 10 nanograms of RNA, there's a, a still a little leeway where you can add more sample, but I would say 10 nanograms or 1,000 cells is the safe spot for stopping uh, the input amount with the type of amount of enzymes and chemistry that we're using. 
For gene targets, we have a transcript on wide as well as targeted approaches. For the number of reads you need per sample, anywhere from 50,000 for a single cell up to one to four million for um, a full transcriptome, depending on the application. Total workflow time takes about um, 12 hours to go through all the enzymatic steps to um, build your library. Typically for building a library, we break this down into two days. The first day is working with the cells or the material, getting it into the reverse transcription reaction. Once we have the cDNA, we know this is very stable. So we spend a lot of time making sure our experiments design correctly. Once we get to the cDNA step, then we combine it and there's just a series of enzymatic reactions downstream of this. Currently, we have indexes to support Illumina platforms, so your MySeq, NextSeq, HiSeqs, and other seeks. The sequencing depends on what you want to do with your experiment. So for the recommended sequencing, we can use either 150 cycles or 300 cycles. The difference in 150 versus 300 really depends on how many reads or how, how long you want to sequence in the gene body part of your um, experiment. With the sequencing and the way that we set this up, we use a paired end read. The first read is going to sequence the gene itself, and this will be used for the alignment back to your transcriptome. Typically, statistically, in humans, if you sequence 75 bases of a gene, you usually can find a unique place in the transcriptome to align that back to you. Um, that's statistically accurate 90-something, 98% of the time. If you're working with genes that have very similar three prime ends, you may actually end up getting those reads to be exactly the same for two different genes and not be able to identify the correct alignment spot. If you go up to 150 bases on the gene body, it's 99.9% .9 sure you can find an accurate place. That accuracy, of course, drops off depending on the transcriptome that you're looking at. So we've developed the kit so that the first read will cover your read body. The second read starts from the other end and will cover the cell ID, the um, plate ID, the UMI, and a little more information about that individual sample. There we only need 27 bases, um, depending on if you have a NextSeq or HiSeq, or 71 if you're using a MySeq, although that could be simplified down if you use a custom primer. So this gives you the flexibility based on the experiment, the transcriptome you're looking at, and whether you want a kind of dirty transcriptome screen where you're interested in just identifying the top differentially expressed genes, or if you want to get a very precise transcriptome where you want to definitely align everything based on a single read alignment. If you want a less accurate, you can do 150 cycles and use 121 reads on the gene body and 27 on the um, sequencing. If you want a more accurate, you can use the 300 cycle sequencing. It costs you a little bit more, but you can use 151 or more bases on the gene body and then use the rest of the reads to cover the sequencing machine. So we've tried to design this with as much flexibility as possible so that depending on the budget, depending on your use case, you can stick with one kit and then just change the sequencing parameters based on the data that you need. These kits are available on Kaijin.com. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about these, um, feel free to go to Kaijin. Search for Kaiaseq UPX3 Prime. You will find the transcriptome kit is available on the website. You can go through and look at the pricing in your region. There's two boxes that you'll need to buy. One is the transcriptome chemistry box. So that will be either the 96, 96M, which is for 384 samples, or the 384 sample kit. Plus, you'll need to buy the indexes. The indexes refer to how many plates you want to combine together. Those are available with just 12 indexes as well as up to 48. So if you're doing a very large experiment, you can actually combine 96 uh, or 48 96 well plates in a single lane on an Illumina sequencer or up to um, 48 384 well plates on a single lane, which gives you about 18,000 transcriptomes worth of coverage. Um, that would probably be... Uh, too many samples for um, a 10 nanogram RNA sample. Um, however, you could probably push pretty much that with a, a single cell experiment if you wanted to. 
So with that, I think I'll close today's uh, seminar. I see some questions in here that I'll answer uh, now that we're at the end. So in summary, today we talked about the Chi-Seq UPX kits for whole transcriptome analysis. Um, these can start with single cells, one to uh, 1,000 cells, or uh, and anywhere from 10 picograms to 10 nanograms of total RNA. This is a three prime uh, reduced transcriptomics um, sequencing uh, library preparation kit with um, included data analysis through the Gene Globe Data Analysis Center. Um, for more information, feel free to, uh, to look at the website.